Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to everyone on the call this morning. I am Bibi Ali, and in my capacity of support to the FAO Innovation Agenda for the Caribbean, it is really my great pleasure to be moderator for today's forum on the use of digital technologies for the provision of technical advisory services and marketing of family farming products. This morning, I am supported by Dr. Tessa Barry of the Caribbean Agricultural Extension Providers Network, Kayaknet. Today's session is actually the last in a seminar cycle of five events. There have already been two seminars that covered the entire region, two that reviewed Brazil, and this final one focuses on the experiences within the Caribbean region. So the big question today is, why are we focusing on the use of digital technologies for the provision of technical advisory services and marketing of family farming products? All of us here are keenly aware of the critical importance of the agriculture and food sector to our own lives. It's how we live and it's how we improve our standard of living. We are aware of the importance of agriculture and food on our communities, our countries and the world. According to global statistics, agriculture and food production accounts for 28% of the entire global workforce and includes 570 million smallholder farms worldwide. We know that most of the farm farmers in our Caribbean region are small farmers and can be categorized as family farms. We are also very much aware that the agriculture and food sector in our region is facing multiple challenges. Today, we are going to look at one of these challenges. We are going to focus on extension and marketing services for Caribbean food producers which are critical areas in the agriculture and food value chain. Today, especially, we are funneling down into the using digital innovations and technologies, which are part of what everyone is calling the fourth industrial revolution to help us find the solutions that we need. It is said that like other sectors, digital technologies are already creating new opportunities to integrate smallholders into a digitally driven agri-food system. This morning, our forum is supported by multiple stakeholders. We have the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, ICA, the United Nations Organization for Agriculture and Food, FAO, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, the Latin American Network of Extension Services, and the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Supply of Brazil. We also have with us this morning our very esteemed panel, Dr. Norma Samuel, Dr. Janelle Joseph, Dr. Victor Falguera, Professor Nia Fanging, Associate Professor Wale Fang, Dr. Courtney Owens, and Dr. Kurt Delis. Given the wealth of information that will be shared in this very short time, I would like to immediately get into the presentations and welcome Dr. Norma Samuel and Dr. Jeanette Joseph, who will be presenting jointly. Before I introduce them, this is just a reminder again to follow the Zoom protocols to maintain silence. To put your questions, comments, suggestions, insights into the chat box. Dr. Norma Samuel is an Associate District Extension Officer the Extension Director and an Extension Agent with the University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences Extension. She holds a master's degree in plant protection and pest management and a PhD in agricultural education and communication with an emphasis on in international extension and a minor in nonprofit organizations. Before migrating to the United States, she worked with the Ministry of Agriculture in Antigua and Barbuda in research and in the plant protection and quarantine unit. 
She has 18 years of experience as an extension agent in the areas of residential and commercial horticulture. She is a master gardener coordinator and is involved with 4-H youth development. Dr. Samuel has expertise in the areas of pest management, volunteer development, risk management, human and organizational capacity building, and of the extension system in the US and the Caribbean. She has led and, and or participated in several international extension projects in the Caribbean and Ghana, and has over 300 publications, and is the recipient of numerous professional awards. She is here this morning as the current chair of the Caribbean Agricultural Extension Providers Network, CAIPNET, and president of the board of the Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services, GFRAS, to develop, to deliver the presentation, Digital, Digitalization of Extension in the Caribbean, Challenges and Opportunities. She is joined by Dr. Janelle Joseph, co-chair of CAIPNET, Dr. Joseph is also an agricultural extension instructor in the Department of Agricultural Economics and Extension in the Faculty of Food and Agriculture, University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. With this introduction, I hand you over now to Dr. Samuel and Dr. Joseph. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Ali, and thank you everyone for joining us today. And as Miss Ali said, we will be speaking to you on digitalization of extension in the Caribbean challenges and opportunities. Before I get into the depth of our presentation, I wanted to give you a background on GFRAS because some of you may not be familiar with the Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services. And GFRAS, as it's called for short, is a registered nonprofit based in Switzerland. And the goal of GFRAS is to build individual and organizational capacity of extension services across the globe. And what we aim to do with that work is that we're hoping that in building the capacity, they in turn will help farmers and other stakeholders to improve their livelihoods and we can see economic growth within the um, different countries. GFRAS operate under 18 networks. And so you see that we have a presence all across the globe. And so this, presentation that we're doing today, it's hosted by Relacere, the network that's for Latin America and the Caribbean, and Kayapnet falls within um, the Relacere network. GFRAS, along with its network, their main areas of focus and knowledge management, professionalization of extension and advocacy, and then the fourth focus area for GFRAS is helping to build the capacity of all these networks across the globe. So that is some background on GFRAS. In preparing for this presentation, we decided to reach out to some of our colleagues within CAIEPNET, which is the Caribbean Agricultural Extension Providers Network, to get some input from them regarding digitalization of extension. So we asked them a few questions. We wanted to see from their perspective how they would define digitalization of extension. We wanted to get information on what they were doing in terms of digitalization of extension prior to COVID and during COVID do they have any policies supporting digitalization in their country and what challenges and opportunities exist? So we spoke to representatives from Antigua and Barbuda, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, Haiti and Guyana. We're also going to tell you a little about digital penetration in the Caribbean because that is important when we talk about digitalization. And we're also gonna share with you digitalization at the level of CAIEPNET. 
So this chart here shows you digital penetration in the Caribbean. And what that simply means is what's the percentage of the population that have access to internet services? So you can see that it ranges anywhere from 32% in Haiti all the way to 90% in Anguilla. So across the Caribbean on a whole, it, it's on average 50% um, digital penetration. And the source for this information is the internet world stats as of March 18th, 2021. So the first question we asked our colleagues was to define digitalization of extension. I'm not gonna go into these different definitions that they gave, I'm not gonna read them, but I'm gonna pick out some key terms that they use. And so they mentioned social using social media platforms, having infrastructure to disseminate information. So they're sharing information. They're also looking at it as a way to facilitate their work um, in conducting um, extension methods. And also they're using it with staff and clientele. And some of them went into depth in terms of some of the tools that you would actually use. So you'll need internet service, computers, smartphones, digital cameras, uh, and things of the like. And very important is that one participant noted that you're providing farmers useful information. And so your farmers and other stakeholders, they get bombarded by a lot of information daily. So it's important that we're using um, these digital tools to provide relevant and updated information to farmers. It's also used as a tool for making decisions at the organizational level and creating farmer databases and also um, database pertaining to production practices. So we did get some good feedback pertaining to their definitions of digitalization. In terms of what they were doing with digital agriculture prior to COVID, it was minimal. And so they were using WhatsApp, phone calls, emails to communicate with farmers. And they use it to complement their face-to-face -face delivery methods. Because you know, the face-to-face -face delivery approach is very important to us um, in extension. Some examples that we wanted to highlight from the information that we gathered is that Trinidad and Tobago representative mentioned that they were trying to build a web presence prior to COVID. And I'll talk to you in the next slide about some of the things that they've done. Um, Jamaica for many years, all of their officers have laptops and smartphones for updating farmers. And they've also created a farmer database that their extension officers can use out there in the field. In Jamaica, for example, they also use digital tools for pest management. So the beet army worm is a pest of economic importance in Jamaica. And depending on weather conditions, the beet army worm population can spiral out of control. So they use this as a way to alert farmers and also the extension professionals of practices that they need to implement when certain weather conditions are, are in place. Now, during COVID, um, the countries intensified their use of digital extension. And so, you know, yes, we all had grandiose plans of implementing um, ex digital extension methodologies, but with COVID, it forced us to propel into offering digital extension services. So they use Zoom and Teams for training both staff and farmers. They intensify their use of WhatsApp and various social media platforms such as YouTube and Facebook. And 
They also use it for immediate response to clientele questions through virtual plant clinics. And when you go to the Trinidad Extension website, for example, you see a chat pops up there and you can chat with someone in real time. So that is really cool that you, even though you don't have that face-to-face -face interaction, you are able to have someone that you can communicate with in real time. This other graphic on the left is taken from the Antigua and Barbuda Ministry of Agriculture page. And they have done an excellent job during COVID to update farmers and also the general public of different events that they have, different, um, different production practices. And so they constantly post on this website. So these are two examples of things that are being done really well. In terms of policies supporting digitalization, most of the countries that we spoke with did not have any policies um, pertaining to digitalizing of extension, but they realized in order for this to be an um, extension methodology that they can use ongoing, they need supporting mechanisms for digitalization. The representative from Haiti mentioned that due to the lack of policies, it hinders the growth of extension in Haiti. And Trinidad was the only country that mentioned that they had a national goal of digital transformation written into the policies of the various ministries. Um, in Antigua and Barbuda, they are using a lot of um, digital extension methods and getting smartphones for their officers. However, they do not have a policy pertaining to digitalization. So I'll now turn things over to Dr. Joseph. Yeah, okay, thank you, um, Norma. So hello, everyone. I'm gonna share on the challenges um, which would have been shared with those who we would have interacted with um, in terms of our discussion to get a feel as to where extension is in terms of getting digital ready. So some of these challenges mentioned, um, I would say re represent typical challenges, all right, across maybe the, the, the globe in terms of transitioning to um, digital means of service delivery. Um, one of the interesting things that stood out was that um, <clears throat> the availability and access to mobile networks um, in the stance of the digital divide, that stood out because, you know, we always have the view that everyone has access to a device, a smartphone, a tablet, as the case may be. However, um, some persons may have more sophisticated devices than others. All right, so that kind of um, poses a challenge in terms of accessibility um, to various mobile networks. Um, despite the region, having a 50% um, digital penetration score, um, there are some instances as well where we do have connectivity issues um, in terms of mobile networks, you know, not functioning as well as they should in certain regions, but particularly um, rural areas um, per se. And the challenge of ICT literacy um, on both the part of the farmer as well as the extension agent. In the region, um, you know, we have an aging farming population. And interestingly, um, our extension agents as well, they are also a bit more on the mature side. All right. So um, their literacy levels for them to transition from these traditional approaches to extension to more digital approaches, um, it requires training, it requires a lot of um, familiarity, getting themselves familiar with um, the use of the tools, with the use of the technology. Um, and also with it brings the challenge of 
you know, the willingness to utilize these technologies. Um, one of the representatives um, which we would have had discussions with shared that farmers, you know, prefer having the face-to-face -face interaction with them rather than the use of digital approaches to extension, particularly because, you know, that's what they are mostly accustomed to. They feel more comfortable that way, all right? So despite now, you know, the transition to minimize the face-to-face -face interaction due to um, you know, the physical and social distancing protocols, and um, there is still that need for the face-to-face -face interaction. Of course, with the digital um, implementation, you know, it, it poses a challenge um, related to funding as well. Purchasing devices, um, making sure that the technology and infrastructural support um, systems are there, it's quite costly. All right, and if we want to have effective um, digital implementation, you know, the, the challenge of funding remains um, there. Okay, yes, sorry. So this is um, a brief snippet from some st a study that um, myself and a colleague, Dr. Barry, conducted early last year when we were all plunged into, you know, the whole minimization of interaction. And so due to COVID, um, you know, we did a rapid study looking at the extension response within the region um, to cope with, you know, the current situation at the time. And one of the questions we asked um, extension agents was, you know, what sort of challenges they personally experienced um, in terms of delivering their extension services to their clients. And interestingly, um, the two main challenges that presented itself was that of restricted movement um, and also working restrictions. All right, um, a lot of the countries, um, you know, would have been thrown into lockdowns and curfews and, you know, limited mobility. So that hindered or that caused a challenge for the extension agents to be able to get out into the field and share, um, you know, with their clients. Interestingly, um, technological limitations, you know, the agents at the time, they didn't perceive that as a major challenge and it only featured as, you know, a very minimal amount of um, percentage in terms of the challenges. However, you know, within the whole realm of their discussion of these challenges, um, we could have picked up some of the instances where technological limitations would have presented um, itself. So move on to the next slide. Okay, so some of the um, comments or respondent quotes uh, from that survey, um, I just point out to maybe point three under working restrictions. All right, um, there are a lot of social distancing which would have affected the working relationship and the eye contact um, with the farmers. So this in itself adds to the challenge that we identified um, a few slides back, whereby you know the willingness to utilize this digital mode of service delivery because of the norm or because of the um, level of comfort um, the clientele may have in terms of, you know, that physical interaction with um, their extension agent and the like. In terms of the restricted movement, um, you know, not being able to move to the farm and make field visits, you know, so you, you're not there to physically see what's happening on the field. All right, so can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, so some additional challenges as well. Um, handling high volume of persons in online classes and in terms of follow-up paperwork. Now, this challenge specifically featured um, from a discussion with our colleague from Trinidad and Tobago, wherein, you know, they have transitioned a lot of their courses, training courses, to an online mode. And, you know, with that, the challenge that presented itself, he mentioned, 
was that, you know, within half an hour or within the first 30 minutes of advertising this training course or the training course going live, as the case may be, um, it would have been subscribed to as much as 1,200 persons. All right, so the challenge in itself comes with now having to manage this large volume of persons, um, you know, to ensure that, you know, the participate in the training, that they access, you know, the, the necessary certificates that would have followed um, in that case. And also, you know, they also pose the challenge of because it's on the digital um, or social media platform, um, you know, there would have been open up to um, persons from outside of the region also joining in. So in terms of logistically, logistics in terms of the digital managing of all these various um, participants that came up as well. Um, in terms of fluctuating networks, you know, sometimes in some areas, you know, we have network disconnections and so, so that's also a challenge. Um, the low incomes of farmers, you know, to purchase these devices to get themselves digital ready. And also in terms of the extension agent as well. Um, some of them would have mentioned that, you know, they had to, in cases where um, work phones were not provided for them, they had to fit that cost out of their pockets as well. All right, we have lack of policies to enhance ICT development in rural areas, as well as lack of necessary skills to utilize um, these technologies. So we move on to the other slide, please. So out of these challenges, um, we identified as well some opportunities. So there is a lot of possibility despite the challenges that um, were identified. Um, one of the main opportunities was that this transitioning from the analog system to digital systems or digitization, all right, that's a very big opportunity for us here in the region, and especially in terms of extension. Um, it minimizes the, or it should minimize the use of um, the traditional paperwork, all right? So that's a, an opportunity that we identified and it's an opportunity that we look forward to. Um, coming out of Guyana, our colleague mentioned that FAO at present is engaged in a pro project with the rice board and um, those in the rice industry to transition their records from the analog mode to digital mode. So that's a very good opportunity in the region. Um, another opportunity is that of course, see thing. Um, utilizing digital tools, digital platforms, it minimizes, you know, the need for expensive travel, all right? I mean, right now we are here in this webinar from all parts of the world, okay? And um, yeah, it probably didn't cost us much to log in or to be able to access this webinar. So that's an opportunity as well, and it can um, augur well for extension within the region. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for retraining of staff as well as stakeholders. Um, you know, if we have to consider the transition again from analog to digital, right, it means that we you know we have to, to train our staff, train our extension service providers to be able to convert, um, you know, all their training programs, et cetera, to fit a digital um, environment. Um, it augurs well for rebranding and repositioning extension, right? Um, you know, a lot of youth um, can seem to encourage youth to enter into um, agriculture as well as extension. You know, we have a um, challenge as well in the region with, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, mature extension agents, all right? So to, um, facilitate the continuity of it, you know, if we highlight the use of digitization, digital tools, and so it can um, um, encourage or, you know, persons to want to enter into, you know, this profession. Um, facilitate enough collaboration as well, it breaks down those spatial walls, those um, geographic uh, boundaries, all right, and we can be able to collaborate um, with various experts and so throughout the world. Um, Kayapnet, for example, you know, we are a network of extension service providers as well as various agricultural scientists 
who are located all over the um the, the world okay so and, and we interact digitally so that's a good opportunity for um extension in the region there's also the opportunity of drafting of policies regarding digitization at this point in time many of the ministries in the region there's no set policy for digitize, digitalization um, and extension per se however they have recognized the need for it more so now so it's a very good opportunity opportunity for us to be able to draft policies that could represent um, digitalization of extension within the region and coming up from haiti you know we have a very highly pluralistic extension system there it's quite fragmented all right so with digitalization there's the opportunity as well to link these various actors next slide please so with kayaknet you know how have we been utilizing digitalization um, initially, we started off having our monthly meetings and so via Skype, okay, but you know, in 2019, we have transitioned to more use of Zoom. Um, just February of this year, we concluded our monthly webinar session whereby we had training sessions for our extension agents throughout the region every month on our Wednesday. And that was conducted digitally as well um, through the use of the Zoom platform, um, our executive and membership meetings. We utilize global expertise for training. We con con conducted information gathering, data gathering through the use of various survey monkey and quality tricks um, as well as google forms for example and we share a lot of information on best practices we also utilize whatsapp and um, some challenges that presents itself um, from kayak next perspective to conduct these webinars you know there's the need for having more than one person to adequately manage the technology all right so that in itself is a challenge one person you know cannot effectively um, manage the technology um there are some issues in terms of connectivity um within the region as well we have some time zone issues or time zone challenges okay jamaica for example they are one hour um, behind our regular time um if we have training with somebody who's joining in let's say from africa or from london for example they may be five hours ahead so the time zones you know that causes a challenge as well and of course the language barriers you know french and um, converting um many of our training modules or programs uh from english into french or spanish you know to post digitally that also is a challenge there right so well that would bring me to the end of you know sharing on the challenges and the opportunities um and i would really like to um share my thanks with those who would have participated in, in giving feedback to contribute to this morning's um presentation and um, yeah if you have any questions we'll be happy to um answer them as best as we can so thank you Thank you very much, um, Dr. Samuel and Dr. Joseph, for that very informative presentation. I think it gave us all a very good foundation to build on for the rest of this presentation. You clearly identified that it's about an average of 50% digital um, penetration across the region um, at the lower end with Haiti, and then there's the higher end probably at, at 90%. Um, you, Apart from the hard data, you were really able to capture the values, the attitudes, and the, the, the belief systems of the farmers themselves, and identified that there, there were basically minimum, minimum standards already, in, um, already operational, but we really do need to create an enabling environment for this to grow further. So thank you very, very much for that informative presentation. We would go straight into our second presentation with Dr. Falguera. Um, Dr. Falguera holds a PhD in Agriculture and Food Science and Technology, as well as a PhD in Engineering and Advanced Technologies from the University of Barcelona. He is the author of more than 40 indexed journal articles 
and several extension contributions. He was twice awarded with the National Prize for Excellence in Academic Performance in the Ministry of Education of the Spanish government in 2006 and 2008. And he also received a PhD Extraordinary Award for his first doctoral thesis in 2012. He was a counselor for education between the years of 2011 and 13, and also mayor between the years of 2013 and 2018 of Albatarek in Spain. He is a founding partner of the companies ACUS International, Eastratos Geosystems, and Enaptec Automation. Dr. Faguera is a freelance consultant and lecturer on innovation-based territorial development strategies and policies and research, development and innovation management for the agri-food sector with a broad experience in Europe and Latin America. He's also a part-time lecturer at the University of Lleida and a member of the managing board of the official association of agriculture engineers in Catalonia. He is here with us this morning in the area of research and innovation management for the agri-food sector and territorial development from the University of Lleida, Spain. His specific topic this morning is the key aspects for designing successful digital tools. Welcome, Dr. Faber. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Thank you uh, for, your, for your kind uh, presentation. And uh, uh, well, um, before uh, getting started, I'd like to send uh, a big hug to our colleagues in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in these uh, hard times that they are going through. And I'd also like to thank and acknowledge the, the work of the international community uh, in helping these uh, colleagues, these people uh, to overcome this situation as soon as, as possible. And uh, well, obviously I'd always like to, to thank the organizing committee of this uh, webinar for your kind invitation. It's always uh, our pleasure to, to participate and to share our thoughts on, on, uh, on the work that we, that we do. Uh, so as we can uh, all together help farmers to uh, have things uh, a bit, a bit uh, easier. So, um, Let's go to the, to the topic for, for today. Um, in the next uh, few minutes, uh, uh, I'm going to try to stick to the time, although it's uh, a little hard for me sometimes. Um, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, these key aspects that we must uh, consider when designing a digital, full, a digital uh, tool for, for extension um, based on some of the issues that we have seen in the previous presentation a uh, very, very nice presentation indeed by Dr. Uh, Samuel and Dr. Uh, Joseph. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, so um, first of all, um, well, um, firstly, we have to define what we consider to be a successful tool. What does successful mean when it comes to a digital tool? Obviously, to answer this question, we have to describe, we, we must uh, have clearly in, in our mind, which is the purpose of the tool? What's it for? What do we want to achieve by making it available, by designing the tool? It may seem uh, quite an, an obvious thing, uh, but that's the main point that we have to keep in our mind throughout the, the design uh, process. Because um, if we don't keep this in, in our mind, things can come uh, difficult or um, we can be mis misled at certain points. And how can we measure if we are successful? Which are the metrics to say so? The number of downloads, the number of farmers using the tool, and what happens with these farmers that only try the system once and afterwards they erase the application, for example. Uh, how, we can uh, be um, misled in these uh, metrics if we only consider the number of farmers that uh, are using our, our tool. And, and moreover, uh, making the users use the system does not guarantee, does not mean that, that the goal, that this purpose is fulfilled. Uh, obviously, it's an essential step up to a certain point, and uh, I'm going to explain this further with an example uh, later that we are going to see. But it seems that making the farmers use the system is a first uh, essential step to be successful. So the ultimate goal is not to have a lot of farmers using the system. This is uh, only a way to achieve the purpose. The, the, the ultimate goal is to fulfill this, this purpose. Um, the ultimate goal is uh, 
for example, can be reducing the impact of pests and diseases at a certain area. Um, is this ultimate goal uh, saving water? Is it uh, helping farmers to develop soil management strategies, for example? Is it a combination of some of these points? Is it uh, communicating or um, establishing or uh, fostering this communication between the advisor and farmers? Which is the goal? We have to keep everything uh, in, our, in, in our mind. So let's go to the, to, to the purpose itself. Um, this um, plan, this way of thinking leads us to focusing on this, on this purpose. What are we really providing with, with, with the extension tool, that, with this digital tool that we are uh, designing? How are we helping farmers in, our, in their day to day? We know that most farmers rarely search for technical advice from their initiative. So uh, how can we reach these farmers? If we cannot reach the farmers, if we cannot reach them, we cannot help them. So the tool will be uh, completely useless if we cannot reach the, the farmers. Um, even if, if it's uh, technically or um, academically even uh, very accurate, um, if we cannot make the farmers use them or we, if we cannot reach the farmers, uh, the, the system will be completely useless. And look, if, if we uh, carry out a survey uh, asking farmers what do they need, uh, what will they say? Uh, probably we may agree that uh, most uh, cases, most of the answers will be related with, uh, with, with money, with, with resources. We need um, inputs at affordable prices. We need to sell our products at higher prices. But later, regarding uh, the digital systems, the digital platforms, um, we see that cost-saving oriented tools are not the top ranked ones. Somehow we have uh, one of these mismatches here. And taking a closer look, um, after years working on this, our experience says that uh, regardless the technical scope, regardless the first level immediate purpose, time and confidence must be in our value proposition. Tools providing farmers with time, saving them time, and with confidence, making them feel safe with their, with their management decisions are always the most successful ones. Um, so if you have to keep just one idea from this presentation, for, from my presentation today, uh, this is the one. Focus on providing time and confidence. Everything else comes after that. We talk, for example, a lot about usability. Usability is indeed very, very important. But uh, for example, during the harvesting season, we know that the farmer won't have time or definitely he will not want to use a digital tool. He is concentrated on harvesting. Uh, and so then what's the importance of usability if the farmer doesn't even log into the system, okay? So this is why we have to concentrate on these uh, two crucial uh, issues, which are uh, providing farmers with time and providing them with confidence on their, uh, on their decisions, which is, in fact, one of the baselines of uh, providing uh, extension services. Um, so we could finish this presentation here. Obviously, we won't. Uh, so uh, take a look at, uh, uh, take a, 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 let's take a closer look at a few highlights on how we address the designing process. Traditionally, we say that uh, digital tools development can be driven by two main forces, these two main forces, the will of solving a problem for a certain group of population, farmers in our case, or a new technology that arises and uh, to which we uh, want to search for new applications. So the market need comes first or the technology comes first. And seeing what I said so far, uh, you can uh, already think that uh, the first one uh, must be always uh, preferable, focusing on this um, market pool in terms of um, market science. Okay? Uh, but the interesting point here is who carries out each kind of innovation in each one of the cases? Who is involved in each step of the innovation process in each case? Let's keep this question in the air okay, for a moment. And I'm going uh, back to this uh, later after reviewing uh, other few um, issues. Um, once we have analyzed uh, so far our motivation and our uh, main uh, drivers, put it this way, we have to set our scope. Uh, and this is also very important. We have to set 
a particular and a specific scope and have it very, very clear. Although we're talking about tools for extension today, the approach uh, is the same and it works uh, that we use when uh, specifically talking about uh, precision agriculture. And why is it um, important and why is it so important? Uh, well, first of all, um, there are not isolated decisions in farm management. Every action, every single action in farm management is engaged within a process, which is in fact the crop cycle, okay? So for example, if we make a tool to ease decision-making, we must consider how and when the data we need to take the decision will be gathered and validated. And what's even more important, we must consider how the farmer will later apply the recommendation. So everything is engaged. And another thing that's uh, even more and more, more important every day, things are changing a lot lately when it comes to digital tools. Connections between systems, between platforms are more and more common every, every day. So when designing your tool, when designing this kind of digital tools, think about how you will integrate data coming from other tools and think about how you're going to create your API to send the data from your tool to other systems, to other platforms. This is essential nowadays. Closed platform um, have a little future to put it this way, okay? So even you, if you're not planning to reach the other steps yourself, if you're not planning to expand the, uh, the, 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 um, the focus of your digital tool to other uh, steps in this cycle, you have to put it this way. You have to think this way. Design the system as if you would. And this will open a huge way of possibilities. And afterwards, um, we're going to see also an example uh, to say this or to see, to see this um, uh, in, a, in a specific way uh, for a, a specific tool. And so every one of these blocks that we've seen uh, has its own complexity. And today we don't have time to address uh, all of them, but let's take at least a closer look at the data writing step, which is frequently um, the most difficult one together with validation in certain cases. If, uh, depending on the way in which we gather data, the validation process is uh, later um, more difficult to put it this way, okay? And uh, this is uh, because uh, although technology is better every day, uh, the best available technology is not always um, available everywhere or for every farmer. And we've seen uh, some of these reasons in the previous presentation or simply, although it may be available, uh, it's not the best choice for a specific case or for a specific use. For example, um, sometimes the best choice for gathering data on how a pest is evolving in a certain area, um, for doing so, we can design a simple form to locate the plot and introduce the trap count or the affectation observations and the farmers uh, may um, be the um, survey monkey, as Dr. Uh, Joseph just said, um, introduce uh, the location of the farm and, uh, and uh, the observations of the affectation of, or the incidence of a, of a pest. And later we can process this information. And if we have a lot of farmers using the system, and here it's indeed uh, one of the crucial aspects, um, and if we have a good validation system, because you know that this kind of uh, gathering data is uh, somehow dangerous, this will be the best choice because this, this will be very, very easy for everyone. And this is not rocket science. This is not a complex technology. And this allows me to explain that, that sometimes the simplest technology is the most useful technology. That sometimes collaboration beats technology. Um, we have nice examples in, in, in different countries. For example, um, in Latin America, in, in Colombia, we have nice examples uh, of, of software, uh, of digital tools that work this way. The point here is that the farmer must receive good return after spending his time feeding the system. So if uh, the, the farmer feeds the system, uh, he will only dedicate his time to, to feed the system if uh, he has the, um, the, the, the good return for spending this, this time. And uh, let's now bring a, a closer context to the Caribbean. 
Um, usually when we think about this, this, the special situation of the small island countries, um, three main issues arise. Obviously, we've seen a more thorough uh, approach in the previous presentation, very, very nice approach indeed. Um, but we are now focusing in three main aspects that I'd like to uh, comment very, very briefly. These are uh, the, the long distances between farmers and advisors, so it's not easy to meet. Um, secondly, the disaggregation, so uh, we have not a large group of farmers together, which makes it difficult, for example, to, to manage training sessions. And uh, the lack of connectivity, uh, which in fact is uh, a common thing in rural areas throughout the world. For example, here in Spain, we have severe um, connectivity problems in, in, in rural areas. Um, and we, uh, this is a common fight through the years. Um, and it's a common thing in rural areas, um, regardless the, the, the country or, or, or even the, the region in the, in the world. So which are the answers that we may find um, um, here? Um, but well, be before that, um, I'd like to state that uh, in the last year, and this is why these are no longer your specific uh, challenges, the, the pandemic uh, has put all of us in front of similar challenges. For example, um, here in Spain, we are closer to each other, but we cannot meet and we cannot carry out face-to-face uh, uh, -face training sessions. And this has been also a big challenge for us. And this is um, in turn completely new for us. So now we have to face these similar challenges, but uh, we um, have to get started in thinking of uh, how we can solve these problems when uh, we cannot meet face-to-face -face when, uh, as Dr. Joseph also also said um, farmers uh, definitely prefer. Um, so how can we address these issues? How can we find an answer uh, to these issues? And here we have some, some, some clues. We have proven that the benefits of the collaborative data gathering um, are essential for this. Uh, collaborative data gathering, uh, when uh, we cannot meet, uh, takes another, another dimension. We've also understood that we must uh, take advantage of the, the tools that farmers already use. For example, uh, WhatsApp, Telegram, um, uh, already, uh, Dr. Samuel already um, talked about that, uh, that also, and, uh, and also uh, Dr. Joseph. Um, there are farmers that don't want to receive anything by mail, and uh, you won't um, change that. Um, regardless the intensity or regardless um, what you uh, can provide them, um, you won't be able to change that. And regarding this also, it's very interesting to see the example of, of the ICAS AgriX app, uh, which we will see uh, later today. It's a very, very nice initiative and an, a very nice example on how to take advantage of Telegram to, to, um, to foster this communication and to take advantage of the digital tools. Um, moreover, the smartphone-based tools are the absolute priority, but they should be preferably multi-platform. This brings a, a number of, of advantages. It makes things uh, easier for system managers, for example. And I'm not addressing here um, the, the question about web-based systems or native app systems, okay? Uh, we can talk about it uh, later, but this uh, would take uh, some more time. Uh, but anyway, uh, offline capability is mandatory. Uh, offline capability is mandatory if, if the system uh, has to be used in the field. So uh, it must not be only web-based, okay? Um, additionally, the digital tools should be launched together with uh, multi-level training and extension structures. And this is the answer to disaggregation. And this allows taking advantage, uh, the best advantage, in fact, of the human capabilities, of the human resources that we have. Uh, what uh, what uh, does it mean? Uh, what's the meaning of multi-level training and exchange instructors? Um, we have to ensure capillarity because if we have to reach uh, the, the same uh, number of farmers that we were reaching before uh, the, the, the COVID strike, um, we can only do so if we train additional people to help us in doing so. Okay, So this uh, is a, a very interesting thing that uh, at least here, 
um, we are starting to focus on uh, since this uh, since the, the pandemic strike. Okay, so well, so, so far we've been um, talking about what. Okay, we focused on the tools on um, on, on what they do and on uh, their properties and on uh, how they are useful to feel, to fulfill a, a purpose. Okay. Let's now uh, have a very brief note on the process, uh, not on the tool, but on the process. And I'm not going to spend much time on this because it would need an entire presentation, but I think I must definitely introduce the way of uh, open innovation, which is, uh, from my point of view, the best answer to the problems of the classical market-oriented design, or at least or considering only that market pool um, design that we mentioned before. And as we left in the air previously, in the traditional way of thinking, uh, in the best case scenario, farmers are consulted in the initial phase of the design, and they uh, later have no other contact with the tool until it's delivered. Uh, after they are consulted uh, at the first uh, designing phase, the RDI staff, both public or, or, or private, do their job, and the technological companies also do their part. But uh, there's little interaction uh, between the different kinds of actors, so we have to change that. Okay? If we want to achieve successful tools in that mean of successful that we want, uh, I mean, to fulfill the ultimate purpose, um, we must engage farmers together with the other relevant actors uh, of what we call this quintuple helix uh, in every step of a process. We must shift from this linear process towards an iterative process uh, represented in this, in this spiral. And this, this, is not, this is not easy. But uh, we have specific ways to do so, and we are in our day-to-day -day, uh, gathering more experience uh, about how to do, to do so. Uh, the interesting thing here is that this approach allows not only uh, developing uh, the specific tools, but also uh, acting on the entire scenario and developing the changes in the systems that we need to set up an entire ecosystem that uh, favors the uh, development of these uh, new tools uh, that we want to uh, be successful in pursuing that goals. Okay, and I'm briefly uh, coming back to this uh, later, but as I said, uh, this would require an entire an entire presentation. So, um, in the uh, let's uh, take a look at three um, different examples um, that go from low technology to high technology in these different degrees, and. Uh, that uh, this uh, different kinds of example with different uh, degree of complexity also um, have been designed following these guidelines that I just uh, review in the last in the last minutes. Minutes. Uh, we are not reviewing the, the 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 three tools or the three initiatives thoroughly. We will only uh, focus on how uh, some things that we have said so far are applied in these in these tools. The first case is this. First case is uh, One Man Pro. This is a tool from Makis International, which is the, the main company with which I am working. Uh, this tool won the, the first prize to technological development three years ago in the Lleida Agricultural Fair, which is one of the most important events in, in Spain. Um, the, this system has several features, but it mainly uh, calculates every week the needed irrigation dose for each irrigation sector and how it should be split. I mean, uh, once per day, uh, twice per day, in four courses per day, and so on. Um, it works using weather forecasts and self-developed algorithms and databases. And um, it's also a communication system between the advisor and the farmer. So uh, if the advisor um, performs a, a field visit, afterwards he can go to the platform and uh, through this system, send uh, weekly uh, recommendations to the, the, to the farmer in a different way. Um, or separately, then uh, it works with the uh, irrigation uh, recommendation. The first thing to be commented here is that um, it's a very versatile tool. Um, uh, you have uh, one single login page, but depending on the user profile, the tool is different. It's multi-platform, so the farmer can do the setup comfortably in the computer, uh, sitting on the couch after having dinner, and uh, um, he only has to do it once and uh, he can do it at home 
um, very comfortably and he has uh, where he has time to spend thinking of how to uh, enter the information and how to later use the, the system. And later in the field, he can see the recommendations um, even if there's no network, no network connection with the mobile app. So this uh, multi-platform device uh, works this way. Um, the system calculates the, uh, every week the recommendation, sends it uh, to the system, uh, to the user, when there's uh, an available network. And afterwards, the, the, the farmer in the field, um, even if uh, he has no network, uh, he can also uh, access to the, to the recommendations. And here we have um, in the lower part of the slide, the strengths of the value proposition. Um, but as you see, as you see um, we have two different kinds of them, two different kinds of strengths. Uh, at, at, the, at the left, um, you see the technical ones, the technical strengths, which would be the strengths that we would uh, announce uh, publicly uh, in the marketing session when selling the system, okay? Uh, you know uh, how it works. Um, these technical strengths are related to accuracy, to usability, um, are related to this uh, engagement with the following uh, actuation step that we saw before. But uh, at the right, you see the real ones. Uh, the real ones lead us to the core of the, of the issue. Um, it provides time and confidence. Uh, this was in fact the, 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 the initiative, the tool that allowed us to verify this, this, this theory. Um, it provides time and confidence because the farmer doesn't get annoyed thinking of this crucial decision, uh, especially in the core moments of the, of, of the season. Uh, secondly, it speaks the farmer's language because um, the dose is translated into irrigation time, which is the way farmers talk about it, although we know that technically it's not that correct because it's dangerous. You know, the different irrigation systems can lead to different irrigation doses with the same time, so it's dangerous. But it's their language, so uh, we adapted the, with the, um, obviously with the needed information introduced comfortably by the farmer, um, uh, we translated this, this uh, output to their language. And lastly, a, a farmer can use the system even without logging in. And how is that possible? How can a farmer use the system even without logging in? Because um, as we know that, uh, as I just said, during harvesting season, farmers will, will not enter the system. They will not definitely use the system. Once the setup is done, they go on receiving weekly recommendations. The system recalculates and sends the information every week without the need of, farmer, of the farmer entering the, 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 the system. So um, this is, uh, from my point of view, uh, definitely one of the key issues of, of, of the platform. Um, the second example is the Stratos platform. Um, it's a data integration platform, um, mainly based on remote sensing, although it uh, provides a number of different functions with different kinds of technologies. And the main thing, it's been designed to break adoption barriers of these uh, technologies, mainly to break uh, adoption barriers of uh, remote sensing. It's available uh, anywhere in the, in the world and the system um, has been made to give a fast uh, response and a, and a fast implementation uh, anywhere in the, in, the, in the world. It has uh, fully automated searching, downloading, processing, cutting and plotting processes with plot-based analysis, uh, with a thorough set of benchmarking tools and so on. But this, this is not the, the, the point for, for today. Um, it has an API to send everything to other platforms, the maps, uh, the calculations, the raw data, everything to third-party uh, platforms. Uh, in fact, this API works so well that it has become the core business of the company, providing processed data uh, to others to other platforms, to other digital tools. So here's another important message. Be open when you design your digital tool. It has no sense at all uh, in trying to close the, uh, the, the business for your digital tool. Um, in this case, um, 
as the company went on opening and opening uh, uh, the availability of the data to third parties, um, uh, be, even business uh, went better and better, okay? Um, it has uh, the, the offline working app also to manage everything in the field. You can, uh, for example, take a picture in the field and afterwards when uh, the farmer has a network connection, the system sends it to the platform. You can see the, West, the web-based environment later, which is more uh, comfortable for the eyes, okay? And it's easy to use um, and, and it's very um, affordable. Uh, I don't uh, like talking about uh, prices because I'm here today to share thoughts and to share knowledge, but um, please forgive me because in, in this case, this is the only way to, to, to tell this. Um, and this is the only way to see this. Um, this platform offers weekly new maps um, starting uh, at uh, 2.8 US dollars per hectare a year. So this is breaking barriers with no minimum. This is breaking barriers. This is uh, breaking also the image that remote sensing is only for uh, big farmers, that remote sensing is only for uh, big advisors. This is not that way anymore. And this is not the only example of a remote sensing tool that is nowadays very, very, very affordable. This has changed a lot. Um, but uh, the most interesting thing is even not, not the price. Most interesting thing is that it's conceived to provide the information a farmer or, or, or an advisor needs at every moment. And let me explain this a little bit farther. farther. Um, if I'm a, an advisor managing hundreds of plots uh, from my uh, farmers, um, seeing all the internal variability of all the plots every week is completely useless. I don't have time to take a look at the internal variability of all the plots of all the farmers that I manage every week. So the system has a solid color um, uh, device, uh, device uh, a, a solid color uh, feature that makes things very easy. It's, it works as a traffic light, for example. Um, for example, if you see a plot in red, the message is run. And by run, I mean, call the farmer and say him that something's happening here, that something's happening in that plot. Hey, uh, look, um, go to the field and take a look at that, at that uh, plot because the system uh, says that something's happening here. And this is uh, taking somehow complex technology and making uh, every time uh, more and more steps on simplification uh, uh, until the, the state in which um, the system is really useful for farmers with very, very low uh, baseline formation or training and, and for uh, advisors that are managing lots of, of, of plots every, every week. And finally, let me mention another example. This, this pilot that we developed two years ago together with the Mobile World Capital Foundation, uh, Vodafone and, and Cisco in our experimental field. Um, this is the, the, the high technology uh, example that I mentioned before. We're going through um, from the low technology example up to the high technology one. And although this is uh, in fact very far from what we are discussing today, I know that, but I'm mentioning this case um, to show that uh, the same principles can be applied to very high technology and to show uh, uh, how this can be applied also to low technology and to high technology solutions that only connect the dots between uh, the already existing uh, technology uh, to create new, new solutions. Um, what we did here was designing a tool to ease work uh, workforce um, training and workforce supervision based on the advantages of, uh, of the 5G uh, connectivity, connectivity uh, because it was the, the core of, or the reason to uh, pay for this pilot, okay? The, the advantages of 5G connectivity. Um, a worker in the field and an advisor in the office were connected um, and the advisor was providing real time on video annotation uh, to ease the, the, the operation of pruning uh, fruit trees. And why do we mention this today? Um, well, because uh, we, prioritize an operation that annoys the farmer because labor force is difficult to train and it's difficult to supervise. And this really annoys farmers. And uh, advisors need tools to ease their job. Advisors need 
advisors need um, tools that make it possible to reach farmers at any time, wherever they are. And again, technology must be at, at the service of, of farmers and also at the service of um, advisors to fulfill their, their role, okay? And um, to finish the presentation, let me just make a brief reference to a more general issue. Um, everything we've seen today uh, in terms of methodology is uh, far more powerful, okay? Starting from this open innovation approach we mentioned earlier, um, we can take advantage of the communication and collaboration tools to foster these uh, collaborative bottom-up development strategies. I definitely loved uh, the, the moments in the previous presentation for, uh, from doctors uh, Samuel and, Doug and Joseph, because both of them mentioned that it's essential to go from the origin um, immediate measures to a strategy, to our overall strategy. Having a strategy is mandatory for everyone. Otherwise we go on um, providing solutions that may work but have no path at all, okay? Um, this, is, uh, this approach is very, very powerful because uh, this allows the territorial needs, what we call uh, the demand-driven innovation to meet the impact-driven innovation, which is the one resulting from top-down public policies and public strategies. And of course, this is far more powerful, but it's also far more complicated. It needs working on actors mapping and uh, on actors engagement, on public bodies commitment, on gathering from local up to international support and uh, large, uh, et cetera, to articulate what we call a shared agenda for systems change. This, uh, in fact, is being um, most of my job during the last years. So I would definitely be more than happy to talk about this, but uh, it's not today's topic. So uh, we'll leave it for, for, another, for another occasion, okay? Um, finally, to, to sum up, uh, just in case any of you finds uh, this interesting, which I definitely hope, to make a screenshot of everything, just remember these this, this highlights. Uh, be open. They, uh, others are designing fantastic tools that can benefit from your solution, for, from your ideas, from your technology. And nowadays, even in terms of business, the solution is being open. The solution is collaboration. We have to enhance collaboration among the users of our digital tool, but also we have to collaborate with others, with other advisors, with other networks, with other developers, with other um, businesses, okay? Um, you have to make your solution so available that it's not worth copying it. Um, this may seem surprising, but uh, now that you know the eStratos example, you understand that. The eStratos platform and the eStratos solution is so available, it's so easy to link to the data uh, and, and the maps and the processed information that it's not worth copying eStratos. Uh, it's better to uh, buy the, 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 the output of the platform. And uh, nowadays, um, some of the best clients of the company work this way. They have their own platform, but the system is so available that it's not worth uh, making a replica, okay? Um, and going uh, to the core, again, of the issue, analyze farmers' decision process, how they think, uh, do not analyze only their needs. If you only analyze their needs, you may be missing important information that leads to farmers not using the tool when it's more crucial, okay? For example, during harvesting seasons when uh, they have a lot of work to do. Um, think about when the farmer will use the tool and how will the farmer use the tool and when he is not going to do so uh, regardless what we do. Think also about how the farmer will apply the tool's output. The best decision is completely useless if the farmer doesn't have the means or doesn't want to apply this decision, okay? Um, customization is key. Uh, this strategy of one size fits all does not work anymore. Um, so think of uh, building blocks when, uh, when designing your, your digital tool. Um, High impact often comes from low-tech solution. Um, I'm happy also to see this 
reflected on the previous presentation. Um, social innovation can be even more powerful than technological innovation. Um, We've addressed this very, very briefly today, but uh, the conclusion is this. Do not have in your designing team experts on technology. Uh, include in your designing team experts on social innovation. This is very, very powerful to understand uh, the way of thinking of farmers. We have to engage uh, these farmers into every step of the process. So this is where it's very important to have this expert on social innovation. And don't be afraid to go back and forth as many times as it, uh, it's needed. Don't let farmers know the system until it comes to the market is a bad thing unless you are Google or, or Apple or Microsoft or, or one of these uh, big players. Okay? But we don't uh, want to play in this league. Um, usability is very, very important, but uh, users' time and confidence are essential. And this is the core message of today's presentation again. And just to sum up everything, we can say that digital tools are only the way to fulfill a purpose. Uh, you don't have to lose your focus. Technology is always a tool to fulfill that purpose. It's never a purpose uh, itself, okay? Um, so um, thank you very much for your time. Hope I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, on time. And uh, feel free to ask uh, now, uh, this morning or later. Here you have my contact, and I will be more than happy to address any question that you that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Falguero. I think you very adequately addressed the key aspects for designing successful digital tools. Clearly, we need to be uh, focused on the, the purpose, the metrics for measurements and the impact of the tool must be measurable as well. Pretty interesting that um, cost saving oriented tools were not the top rant, but rather time giving and confidence in decision making with the, with the tools that made a lot, a lot of difference. That was pretty interesting. Uh, we're moving right along. Um, can I ask the presenters to focus on the time? We have three presentations still to, to get through and we have to end at 11. So. Without, um, I'm going straight into our next present presentation. Our next presenter is Professor Nia Feng Ng, who is a member of the State Council Leading Group for Poverty Alleviation and Development Expert Advisory Committee, Secretary General of China Agricultural Modernization Association, and a member of the Advisory Committee of the UN Secretary General's Food Systems Summit in 2021. She has led more than 100 research projects founded by domestic agencies such as NNSFC and MARA and international organizations, including FAO, WFP, UNDP, CABI, IFAD, and ADB. Professor Nia has worked in the areas of food security and nutrition, poverty reduction, and international cooperation strategy. She is here with us this morning in her capacity as the director, Deputy Director General of the Agricultural Information Institute and Deputy Director General of the Center for International Agricultural Research and the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences, as well as the Chief Scientist of the International Agriculture Research Team. This morning, she is sharing with us digital agriculture extension in China she is joined by Associate Professor Guo Feng, Deputy Director of the Ecological Agriculture Information Service Laboratory of the Agriculture Information Institute of the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences. He is focused on ICT application in agriculture and rural development, such as cloud computing, the Internet of Things, and big data. He has experience in several nationwide research projects such as the National Science and Technology Support Program, research and application of cloud computing technology for rural information service and public sector scientific research funding program, integration and demonstration of agriculture extension service based on ICTs. We welcome our next presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, and uh, everyone. And uh, thank you for the committee invite uh, me and uh, Dr. Guo Feng to join this and uh, important uh, events. 
And also thank you Dong Le and Xiao Jie to help and to uh, facilitate this and uh, connection. And uh, so, and uh, I, I learned a lot from the, the two presentation. And uh, I, I think yes, now we are focusing on how the digital and the equipment or ICT help the, and the extension and the staff to use uh, and the digital ICT to do extension work. So for the, uh, for the main content is about the, maybe uh, mainly I think the, the two part, but the first part is about the uh, background about China agriculture extension system and then and digital extension practice in China recent years and uh, the case solution for the digital agriculture extension. And uh, finally, I think uh, a short discussion and uh, with, with, uh, with you. And for the agriculture extension system, I think uh, yes, uh, I think China is the, for the extension system is a little complicated because it's composed of the, a serious uh, public institutions and also private sectors international organization and NGOs. For the public institution, including agricultural extension agency and uh, by the government and supported at a different level in China. And the research institutions and universities also and uh, joined the extension work through their projects and also private sector and involved in uh, some input like uh, and the seed fertilizer machinery and also agriculture and uh, uh, provide and uh, the technicals and the services also for farmer cooperatives and the uh, emerging force in technical and the support. And uh, they also provide a lot of um, technical and the services. So in China, I think the major force of agriculture extension is a public one. We has the five level in the extension system from the more Ministry of Agriculture and the foreign, uh, foreign Affairs. We have the national and uh, extension station. And then in provisional level, we have 31 provisional level and extension uh, center and then the regional and then the county. And the finally, the township. So there's a five, five level agricultural extension center or station, like uh, focusing on crop, livestock, fishery, machinery, and uh, some specific co uh, commodities and the specific technologies. And in each township, even in a remote area, there are agricultural extension station in China. So they are the major working force in extension in China. So how about the digital extension in China recent years? And as we know, we, we have a lot of and the institutions and uh, involved in the extension services by using ICT or digital tools and the uh, recent years, like uh, in the Central Agricultural Broadcasting and uh, school, I, I think they it also has the, uh, at least two level from the national level, provincial level, sometimes in, 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 in some cases, the regional level will have broadcast and the school. And the, they provide a lot of training related with uh, like ICT, like how to use the smartphone and uh, the, this is the one I think is yes, the public institution involved in technology extension. And also we have some state owned enterprises like Telecom. They also since 2014 and they have developed their own and uh, uh, APP or websites to provide the technology for farmers. And also we can, we has the CNKI and uh, formerly or, or, or originally 
they only provide the journal and the articles and also the dissertation uh, for the experts or for the students. And the recent years, they also provide some and the common technology and for the local farmers and also for the extension and the staff. And also we know a lot of agribusiness and they also provide some technology and uh, by using the new and the telephone and the smartphone or other ICT advice. So this is one example for a one company to provide the technology. And uh, also we have a, a special and uh, APP and also provide by the uh, private sector, we call the smart APP. They also carry out a lot of information services and for the agriculture, we call it uh, non doctor, it's agriculture doctor. And also we, we can see in the major force is the extension worker, how we use uh, the ICT to help this extension worker and to help them to do agriculture extension from the CAS. I think since two, 2000 and, uh, 2005, and the CAS team began to build the framework of cloud, we call the agriculture cloud platform. And uh, under the support of the Ministry of Agriculture, and we designed and constructed National Agriculture Extension Column to pro provide various services for agriculture extension staff from different levels, especially from the grassroots level. And also I think yes, uh, uh, the function is providing information and also provide uh, the, uh, the consulting and idea and also technical solution. And also, I think is yes, uh, uh, for the, their function. I think is yes, is is also and the uh, basically is uh, idea is uh, uh, provide a lot of and uh, integrated a lot of resources and the knowledge from different kind of the resources, and also. And uh, they, they uh, including different sector, different agency, different department, and also they provide a lot of and uh, uh, extension and uh, staff with smart and the terminals. I think at the beginning in two thousand five, we use the portable um, and and uh, uh, the computer. Then and then they use the uh, the pad. Now I think they use the smartphone and. Uh, is uh, is very common and uh, access to the to the uh, to the cloud, and also we provide the uh, this the the, the framework and um, to provide the this and uh, the the this and uh, information or technology the cloud and uh, through different uh, through the different uh, and the technical and the solution provide this and the uh, information and the uh, expertise to the remote experts and to various region and also and uh, to uh, provide this information uh, to 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 some, some micro and uh, the agribusiness and the man and also i think is uh, this is a platform or this cloud is based on the knowledge so we have uh, and uh, gathered all of the knowledge and uh, our technique, tech, technology together and uh, build the Q&A database. And then they now they can and, uh, and uh, self-learning and they can autonomically answer and uh, measure of like, this question. So, and uh, it's, uh, we can do it and uh, based on this and uh, and and the list cloud, and the, we can provide the value added service and the experts consultants. We can have a online and uh, uh, online and the data diagnosis room, and also we have we can have the one on one and the tutors and the targeting on the different uh, specific and the crop and the specific and the issue, and. Uh, 
uh, also and this and uh, uh, cloud pla platform can provide online training and they can learn by themselves and they have different license different chapters and we, we also and the design lists and the, uh, the courses uh, according to the different team and the demands so I think it's uh, it's built in uh, 2005 maybe the early one of the earliest one for the provide and the services and the training and to the uh, to, to the and the uh, extension work and uh, however and uh, it's we, we found that it's uh, really uh, need a lot of investment since 2005 and uh, we we have applied and the two huge project or big project in 2009 and 2013 and the continuous support from the public but also I think it is not enough we also want to is the issue is how private sector also and has the incentive to invest in this kind of a public cloud and uh, it's an I think it's also need a uh, I think I need a, a marketing uh, oriented approach to identify and uh, which part I think mainly and supported by the government and the fund. And some we can attract private sector to uh, join this and the cloud and to more investment and to provide the more and the useful and, uh, and the services. And I think the second challenge is about the capacity building. When you talk about the ICT, I think it is very new and also it's developed every day. So the training is really important. So I think in recent years, we have a lot of and the, uh, the, the training program from the private sector, also from the public sector only to training people how to use the smartphone like uh, uh, like the uh, Qi Dong Yi, the, the, the secretary of the FAO and the said is a smartphone is one of the new agricultural tool so how can we and uh, and and found the mall and the farm to training I think it is also is uh, is very necessary but also we we need to considering a lot of things like and uh, uh, what's how can we and the design and the, the, the courses how can I organize the courses and uh, also in, in this term uh, how can I attract more and more public and the societies to help to join this and the training and the program to help more and uh, and the staff workers to easily access to this and uh, uh, we can say the, the, the cloud and also the cloud itself and also to need uh, the training to use the new tool or new technology to provide efficient and the services. And also I think the third is the learning for shame. And also I learned a lot from the two and uh, from the two present, present the speakers and they talk a lot about learning and sharing and sure and we need to exchange we need the communication we need the collaboration and in different region different topic and that's my presentation thank you very much thank you for your attention Okay, thank you so much um, for that wonderful presentation. I think what came across really clearly uh, from the example is that there is a there is an agri extension ecosystem within China itself. It's fully integrated. It's urban and rural, and you you appear to have buy in at the highest level with the the ministry itself launching training programs. It's very interesting that you you identified a, uh, a couple of um, areas that needed to be addressed, the, the use of a market approach and the greater collaboration of the private sector. So I think all of those are 
really important points that we need to take into consideration as we plan our digital strategy for agriculture across our region. Thank you so much for that. Our next presenter is Dr. Courtney Owens. Dr. Owens received his Bachelor's of Arts in Political Science and a Master of Science and Professional Service in Agricultural Education. He holds a PhD from the University of Florida in Agricultural Education and Communication with a specialization in Extension Education. He also received a certificate in Leadership in Agriculture and Natural Resources from the University of Florida. In his capacity as a United States Peace Corps volunteer, he served as an agribusiness advisor to local cotton farmers in West Africa. Upon his return to the US, he provided several years of leadership for the Farmers Adopting Computer Technology Program, the FACT program, in the Cooperative Extension Program at North Carolina a and State University. Dr. Owens prepared financial farm management programs that improved the record keeping needs of small and limited resource farmers across the state of Carolina, North Carolina by using computer technology. In August, 2019, Dr. Owens was appointed as the interim associate extension administrator. He has a, over a decade of experience in numerous extension positions including field agent, extension associate, interim co-director of county operations, and assistant extension administrator for program and staff development and reporting. In, align in alignment with the extensive service he provides in several extension areas, his own research focuses on improving participation in cooperative extension service by eliminating barriers for minority populations within urban and rural communities. He is here this morning as a part of the Kentucky State University Cooperative Extension Program to share his presentation, Barriers and Challenges to Digital Extension for Undeserved and Minority Audiences. Welcome, Dr. Owens. Thank you very much. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, I see a thumbs up. Thank you so much. Hold on. So with COVID, um, I'm also working from home. Just wanted to put that disclaimer out here so I don't have the luxuries of everything in the house, at, at the office, but everything is going to go just smoothly. <laughs> um, again, thank you for that wonderful welcome. Um, I'm very um, pleased to be here to talk about uh, the barriers and challenges to um, digital extension for underserved and minority audiences. So um, today I would like to talk about for the agenda, a quick overview of cooperative extension um, and the 1890 extension system, define underserved and underrepresented audiences, talk about some barriers and challenges we had here at Kentucky State University um, communication to stakeholders, how important that is during a pandemic, digital extension approaches that we have found to be successful, um, and recommendations and strategies. So um, really quickly, I want to just talk about the 1890 Morrell Act. And this was sponsored by Senator Justice Smith um, in 1890. The intent was to expand on the 1862 Morrell Act, which also focused on agriculture, home economics and mechanical arts. Uh, the second Morrell Act was signed in 19, 1890 by President Benjamin Harrison. And this, this, the second Morrell Act focused on um, institutions that were practicing racial discrimination um, and was not allowing individuals to attend people of color to attend those institutions. So the states were given the option to create an 1890 land grant, which um, Kentucky State University is an 1890 land grant institution. And because of that, um, it was able to establish uh, additional partnership and form formalize a partnership and relationship with 1862 land grants. As you um, may or may not know, 
we have 111, 112 land grants. And out of the um, 112, we have 19 that are historically black institutions. And again, we have tribal colleges, um, which are 33. So here's the map. So people, you know, just in case you did not know, um, we have in the, the uh, 1890s are represented in the Southern region of the United States. And um, this is where I'm centrally located in Kentucky. And as you see, um, the, the, white star, the white stars are represents the 1890s. And you can see the 1862s and the 1994, which are the tribal colleges. So the mission of the 1890 Cooperative Extension System um, is to assist diverse audiences um, to work with limited socially disadvantaged and economic re resources to improve their quality of life and to also help engage and uh, provide that research-based knowledge to the communities. The vision um, is similar, but it's the focus is to make sure that we're the premier and top educational system that work with underserved and diverse audiences um, and to promote sustainable economics environments and communities and families. So as we all know, and you know, all the speakers that came before me have really um, convey the same um, message that I will, you know, say today, but, you know, moving to a virtual platform is not easy. Um, we had some challenges um, that I will, um, you know, go over in a few seconds momentarily, but it was a great opportunity. And we didn't know when, you know, COVID started that it was going to allow us to reach more people than we ever thought possible. And so um, we had to figure out how to learn. Um, and I wanna talk about it from the perspective of our extension educators. Our extension educators had to retrain themselves, had to reposition themselves, and also they had to connect with um, other colleagues across the United States to see how they were using best practices for digital extension. So I wanna go over the term of underserved audiences. Um, this term um, describes a particular demographic that typically does not have access to services. Um, it's a segment of a community or population that is not currently being served by organization, they're not engaged. And sometimes we use the word underrepresented because they're not at the table when we think about having programs and implementing those programs. So in extension, one of the things that we have to do um, across the board, even if we're at 1890 or 1862, we look at parity. And this is where we look at the population uh, and make sure that the programs that we're reaching is reaching all demographics um, and are equal and um, de equal demographics and making sure that we have all reasonable efforts to make sure that we reach those clientele. So now I wanna talk about the barriers. Um, technology access, broadband and the digital divide, communication gaps and financial hardships and transportation for stakeholders. And give me one second here, cause uh, okay. I couldn't see my screen for a second, sorry about that. So there are a lot of barriers when it, you know, it comes to working with underserved populations, um, things that we may take for granted, or um, for, for instance, the, the ability to go out and buy the, um, the latest laptop or have um, iPads or computers. Um, another issue is in Kentucky's broadband, internet access across the state. Where I am currently um, housed, um, I do have access to broadband, but it is limited to the networks and services that I can use. But in the eastern part of the state, um, that is not the case. So we found that that was a challenging um, and eye-opening experience when trying to deliver digital extension. Communication gaps, uh, rapport with minority audiences is a must. And so during this uh, pandemic, we had to identify different ways in which we could um, maintain and continue um, the rapport that we have established with these um, 
um, since these uh, these community these communities that are at risk, and being able to afford fast speed internet versus um, other essential things that people might need, example, um, food, clothes, or just you know other things that are more pressing uh, to certain families. So we had to think about that. And as far as extension educators, um, just needing uh, more of their um, time promoted to um, getting equipped to understand digital extension. A lot of our educators were face-to-face. -face. There was a lot of technical assistance that was done face-to-face. -face. A lot of hours, a lot of time went into that. And so when COVID hit, we had to re-examine and, um, and reimagine what extension would look like and how we can best stay um, above some of these challenges that we're, we were facing. Um, like for example, just understanding Zoom and Microsoft Teams. A lot of our educators were not um, using those services for their programs. They were doing just face-to-face. -face. And constantly working from home with no true separation. Um, I do, you know, I will share a little bit about the work-life balance a little later, but I think that was um, very telling for a lot of people uh, when we had the lockdown and shutdown and we, you know, working from home, there was no separation between work and, you know, and family life, you know, because you were working constantly and understanding appropriate technologies for our stakeholders. So extension educators having to take the time to do needs assessment surveys to ask the questions which which um, technologies are appropriate to their to their neighbors and to their stakeholders. So the digital divide, as I mentioned earlier, is very um, prevalent in Kentucky. Um, we have 120 counties, and 35 counties have been identified as distressed counties in Kentucky because of persistent poverty. Um, no access to broadband, et cetera. And so the Center for Rural Development have been working um, closely with um, governmental agencies to identify solutions for uh, broadband. And one of the things that they also looked at is just Kentucky Broadband Initiative, Internet Speed Test um, Kentucky. And so this is an opportunity to um, see where your internet speeds um, currently um, rely um, lie on and what your speeds are currently and how um, effective you know increased efforts to um, bring in broadband would be significant. And we also looked at Strike Force initiative for rural growth and opportunity. That came again for the persistent poverty counties. Not only are these counties um, not only does this county do not have broadband, they also lack um, many resources. And so a lot of times these are the areas that we work in in the state because of their underserved and underrepresented audiences. So communi communi communication for stakeholders to address needs. Um, it's very important to understand what our stakeholders need. I know, I know for us, there has been some programmatic issues as it relates to how we deliver certain programs. And there was a comfort to, I like to deliver programs face-to-face. -face. Um, and with the pandemic, we had to send out a survey asking not only stakeholders, but addressing the concerns of the agents to what, what are the needs that they have to move forward and then sending a communication out to our stakeholders. So <clears throat> in March of, um, uh, roughly in March, we started putting, March, 2020, um, we started putting some questions about COVID on our website, um, very anonymous. It wasn't anonymous because we wanted to know who these individuals were, however, but it was a quick question like, um, how can we find resources to help us during the COVID-19? And so that was a quick um, submit button, um, just asking for emails, first and last name, and then their particular question. It was not um, related to necessarily our extension program um, that we offer at Kentucky State, but it was just to understand 
This, this was when the pandemic was very new. People had questions about COVID-19. And so we wanted to make sure we was a bridge of um, knowledge to those stakeholders. So a step further, we took, um, we did a needs a stakeholder um, questionnaire to our stakeholders and asking them how KSU um, extension programs can best serve them. And so we knew that there was challenges that Kentuckians were facing. And so we wanted to address that and, um, and just ask them questions about their social well-being, economic well-being, health, and how we could best um, craft and develop programs related to their concerns. It was a very short um, survey, 14 questions, and it was sent out to our stakeholders that have been a part of our extension programs in the past and or they were presently working with programs that we are still administering. We had a total of 450 respondents and out of the 451 respondents, we sent it out to around five to 600 people. So we asked a question about receiving information related to COVID-19 and um, this is the breakdown of how they would like to get that information. And this was some of our um, stakeholders, but again, this is not a, a, rep a true representative, representative of the, um, the population because um, everyone doesn't have access to now, broadband. Now we did ask um, another question about having access to a smartphone. And a lot of individuals, 90% um, of the population said they did have access to a smartphone. But in, in receiving this information, we wanted to know if you know, they still wanted that direct contact with, with our county-based agent. Um, if they wanted information through a podcast, blog, newspaper articles, webinars and trainings and Zoom or other um, relative platforms. So based on that information, we started creating virtual programs. Um, our, all areas, family consumer science, FCS, um, 4-H, community resource development and ag and natural resources and aquaculture, because we have that program too, started doing virtual programs. And we recorded these sessions um, with the help of our media and communication, and we put them on social media platforms and we aired them at different times of the day that was convenient to our stakeholders. Because again, a lot of these individuals were working a full-time job, um, having to do, um, um, they was having to teach their student, their kids for virtual um, education at home. So it was a way for us to reach our stakeholders at um, different times. So our community resource development um, specialists worked with um, small minority business owners and they helped them with information related to COVID, COVID relief funds, um, providing them with grants and giving them information. And so these are several of my employees that were working with businesses in providing them with um, stimulus money to continue their business during COVID. But they worked with them um, face to face and virtually because of you know, the pandemic. But this is um, an opportunity that they was providing that information to these um, stakeholders. We also developed educational packets because one of the issues that we found is that a lot, um, social, a lot of socially disadvantaged or underserved um, audiences um, tr uh, transportation is a um, is important aspect to take into consideration because a lot of the kids want to participate in 4-H and youth development programs, but they they cannot get there. And so what we did, um, we took um, we had some some social media posts and we also had some 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 sign in sheets from previous participants and we reached out to them and they were willing to share their contact information so we can ship um, 4-H STEM, arts and crafts and other programs to our youth that was participating in 4-H. Um, it's also good to note that we, we work with 4-H at home 
having over 280 80, um, online activities. And we use Google Classroom, which was something that our stakeholders did not have to pay for. And, and at the time um, we were transitioning with getting our Zoom um, accounts. We had Zoom, but we didn't have enough Zoom for all of our um, county-based staff. So this was a way for, um, for our educators to work for our population and provide resources to them. One of the most important aspects that came out of um, our pandemic and digital extension was the healthy food initiative that we um, started during the pandemic. And this was an opportunity to, um, to showcase um, food production and work with socially disadvantaged and limited resource farmers and um, stakeholders and help them understand how they can grow food because a lot of people was growing food, um, showing them dem virtual demonstration, food safety, and providing them with um, tips on how to grow it. Not only did we um, do that, we were able to, you know, post these videos and have videos where people could um, work alongside us and see, the, you know, the different growing stages. But we also was able to donate um, several pounds of produce, four million pounds of produce, and we donated to charities and local um, faith-based organizations. So <clears throat> we have um, never had a virtual small farm, small farm conference, uh, which is our small limited resource minority farms conference. And we have a third Thursday program. So every Thursday we have a program um, related to ag and natural resources for our stakeholders. And that has always been our traditional program that we do face to face. So um, trying to stay connected with our stakeholders. We moved all of that to virtual um, recording, pre-recording sessions and advertising this on our social media platform. Um, since April of 2020, um, we were able to increase our, um, our visibility by having it on social media with 11,289 viewers. 4,000 of those viewers were unique viewers and 703 were total engagements. But what was more impressive to me, we was able to market our small farms conference to 24 states. And we had a, um, 329 people register. And that was very impressive because we had 12 concurrent sessions going on. So re recommendations and su suggestions that I have, um, Again, I think extension educators should partner with organizations that are currently working to enhance areas that do not currently have access to broadband. Um, one of the things that we had to do um, for our agents and educators, some, some, since some instance we had to provide hotspots. We had to give them um, hotspots so they could be connected to their stakeholders. Uh, some instance we also provided hotspots which were um, a mechanism so you can get online, and we put it in a um, uh, we put it in a car, and locations like that where students can they can walk to and they can have access to do schoolwork, and so I feel like that's one way that we can stay um, connected with our stakeholders, but also just going back and understanding what their needs are and not developing programs that are comfortable to us but are comfortable and, and the need they need the need of the um, program is coming from the stakeholders. And so um, I also want to just say that with the survey design, we also looked at the uses of gratification theory, which is a um, communication theory, but we focus on determining the social media that satisfy or the media that satisfy that particular individual. So we wanted to know if the the um, the stakeholder wanted workshops, videos, newsletters, and these are all things that we came out of the pandemic creating newsletters and weekly newsletters, virtual programs, so we could satisfy um, our clientele. One last thing um, I wanted to mention is the Agri Safety Learning Lab. Um, I came across this uh, by um, doing some research, but I felt that it was something I would like to share 
because um, not only are we trying to disseminate information to our stakeholders and make sure that they have the information that they need to be successful in their farming enterprises, or um, just being a productive citizen with youth development or education. I know that mental health and stress management is important for the educator, not only to the educator, but for the clientele. So if you haven't already um, um, viewed this website, I, I highly recommend that you do so you can get um, information related to stress management. Because again, that work-life balance was very, it was disruptive and COVID was a disruptor. And because of that disruptor, innovation did come out of it. And so um, I'm glad to say, even though we have clientele that are hard to reach and sometimes um, they don't have the resources, there's still ways to reach those clientele. So I would like to just end um, presentation right here and just talk, give you my contact information if you have any questions. And so um, I am thank you for this opportunity. Again, the presenters that have um, preceded me have mentioned um, this, some of the great ideas. And I wanted just to share what we have done at the 1890 and taking um, into consideration the underserved and underrepresented audiences and how you have to tailor, build rapport and work with them based on their needs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Owen, for that wonderful presentation. Clearly, um, you shared with us very important lessons learned. I think your starting point of reimagining what extension could look like, would look like, should look like is very important. Uh, your information that the agricultural educate, the agri-extension educators needed themselves to be retrained and repositioned are also very important points. Thank you so much for that again. We are on to our very last presenter. We have reached the 11 a.m. mark, a little bit over time, but the, um, this is the last presentation. I would like to introduce you to Dr. Delise, who is currently the ICA's Special Affairs Coordinator for the Caribbean region and the ICA representative for Suriname. He holds a PhD in Rural Development from the Postgraduate College in Mexico, in addition to a BSc in Agronomy Engineering and a MSc in Agricultural Diversification. Ms. Dr. Delis is a Certified Project Management Professional, a member of the Project Management Institute, Pennsylvania, USA, and holds certificates in Financial Management and Payment Procedures for the European Development Fund. Fluent in English, Spanish, French Creole, and a good working knowledge of French and Dutch languages, he has more than 20 years experience working in agriculture and rural development issues in Latin America and the Caribbean. His main areas of interest are sustainable agricultural systems, organizational strengthening of producer organizations, public sector project management, and funds procurement for development projects. He advises and lectures in project management and funds procurement for development projects with particular emphasis on scope, cost, schedule, and risk management. He has authored a number of papers in agriculture and rural development, as well as public sector project management. He is here this morning as our final presenter to share the experience of the AgriX app application as a tool for digitizing extension services in the Caribbean. Welcome, Dr. Delis. Thank you very much, moderator. I trust that you can hear me clearly. Yes, I can. Thank you, and thank you to the other presenters this morning, and morning to all the viewers and participants in this, in this forum. Uh, the presentation basically is entitled Experience of, of the Agri-Extension App, or agri App, as we call it, as a tool for digitizing agricultural extension services in the Caribbean region. And it's basically one of the digital applications that, that ECA has developed to assist um, the member states in the Caribbean um, if rural extension. So I'll get right into the presentation.
Thank you. Okay. Why and how did the application come about? Um, we were already dabbling in, in, in issues of digital applications and digital agriculture with, with many of our member states. But COVID added a, 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 a new urgency in, in, in indirect responses to the challenges that it brought about particularly due to restrictions in movement and, of course, student the time engagement of extension and farmers. Um, that was a severely affected. So in one of the meetings we had with the, with the ministers of agriculture in the region in April of 2020, they brought up the urgent issue of how to continue supporting their farmers in the field with extension officers not being able to, to, to move around as normal and attend and provide the services that they require. The app was, was fully developed in ours by our information and communication um, technology department. Uh, the whole structure and the content design was a collective effort with our IC department, um, other specialists in ECA, um, the ministries of agriculture, the extension service pro, um, officials and farmers uh, in the field in the, in the countries that we piloted and of course the ECA staff in these countries. Um, basically the objective of the application is to assist extension services to increase coverage and information dissemination, technology transfer, networking and of course quality control. Um, initially the app we, we piloted in three countries, Antigua and Barbuda, the Bahamas and St. Vincent and the, the, the Grenadines. These were the countries that were, were readily um, willing to to, um, to utilize the app due to the severity of the challenges that they were facing with food supply um, during that time. Um, some of the key products that we were, were looking at based on the, the nature of these countries, fruits, fruits and tubers, particularly um, livestock, swine, poultry, small remnants, but the app could also accommodate any number of of, of, of proper product groups that, that one um, um, desires. Okay, what are the main features of the application? Um, the, 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 the app is designed, it is basically, although the, the, the base and framework and structure of the app is the same, but the actual design of content is country specific. Because of the, the because there may, there may be different priorities for country, so we allow that liberty for countries to determine what is the content. One might want to focus on crops, another one marketing. So they are able to determine what constitutes the content of the application. Um, the app can be accessed on the phone or on the web if you're a normal PC. Um, the, the 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 format that we have engaged in initially was the uploading of fact sheets of key crops or, or products for farmers based on the countries, based on what the extension officers in the country determine uh, 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 are the priority crops um, for, for the countries. But it's also, we could upload other types of information as well. Um, also the app would allow for alerts and to provide real time information for farmers. And, and these would include information on crop management, crop agronomy, good agricultural practices, sanitary and, and phytosanitary information. There is also that online assistance on demand. And the app allows to establish networks, network of users by country. For example, within the application, you could say, okay, we could have a root crops group, a fruit crops group, um, or, or different categories, um, categories of, 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 of either types of crops or whatever dispensation you would like. Um, and the app, basically the app is, is available on the App Store, Google Play, um, on Google Play. Um, once we activate it for a country, farmers can freely, extension officers can freely download the application. Um, how does the app look? Okay, so the app allows once you are registered, which will be handled by an administrator, um, ECA would train the, the staff in the Ministries of Agriculture, 
um, they would identify uh, an administrator within the ministry. Uh, we would conduct the training if part uh, with the, the administrators, extension officers, um, so they would know how to utilize the app. So they would give access and register new entrants into, into the use of the application in, the, in that specific country. So they would have the login where you could, as you normally do for any other application. Okay, so basically that's just a slight example of how it would look when you when you when you when you go into the application. These are some of the, 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 the these are some of the, the fact sheets that we have uploaded for Antigua and Barbuda. So if one wants, you could see the name, the scientific name, common name. Very important the common name because some common names of crops vary from from even within one country, from area to area and between countries. So we put the common name when the, 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 the information was uploaded. And of course, you could click on the detail to get whatever you want. Uh, so we have the fact sheets. We have um, right away the farmer could see latest pests on diseases that he could seek detail for if he so desires. On the, to the right, you would see basically um, a, a, a historical of when the information was posted, what news are available. So the farmer, if he wants to follow up, extension officer could go click directly and see what is the latest news, what is the latest information that is available. Okay, so basically here is going into one of the, the fact sheets for, you'll see that for sweet potato. And basically the way that one is designed, you have again, scientific name, common name or the names, um, a brief description of, of what that crop is. These are provided, these, all these would be inputted by the extension officers themselves based on the needs of their country, what they determine is relevant. Also, you'd see, you'd see below there is an opportunity that they could add on links as well. That if someone wants, a farmer wants to go and get additional information, series, you could put as many links as you want that the farmer could go in and seek more information on, on, the, on that specific crop. Then we have climate and soil, and the farmer could also get information on the production harvest and post-harvest best practices at, at, um, at his hand. Okay, so again, um, let's continue. Okay, so here is the fact sheet for pests and diseases, and I highlighted the, the fact sheet for the crop production itself. Uh, the crop cultivation and production itself. And here we have the, 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 the fact sheet for phyto, um, for pests and diseases. We have a Silas formicarius, common name potato weevil, as just an example. And you would see the farmer is able to come and get a description of the pest, see what kind of damage. And the farmer could also have access there to see, okay, what, what, what is available to control that pest, whatever, whether it is um, integrated methods, whether it is a specific pesticide, or whatever recommendation the country um, it is utilizing for its farmers. But very importantly, we are also able to upload photographs in there that the farmer could see. So if he is in the field and he pulls out his, his cell phone, he could go directly into that, look at the crop, and compare to see whether that damage reflects um, what he's what he's seeing. And, and have a sense of what he's facing. If not, the farmer also has the option to write directly send an, an app in the group for another farmer to respond to or directly for the extension officer to respond to. Okay, so here you would see that the farmer here, the farmer could join the chat group. He could pose questions in the group. Um, there's an emergency contact number um, for any serious issue that the farmer would have observed in the field or, or someone observes in the field that he could call directly to an extension officer or some person of contact to directly report it. And other farmer could post that random in the chat and get either responses from other farmers or from extension officers. One of the advantages there that everyone could see and everyone gets a response on an issue that may also be um, um, relevant for them. Okay, so here again, we just see more crops being offloaded here, as I mentioned before, with the diseases associated with, with some of it. Okay. 
a repeat. Right. So that's basically how the app would look and, and how it is um, um, anticipated that it would operate. Now, in developing the app, we did do conduct a survey, both a survey among extension officers and farmers to get inputs for the design of the application. I just pulled out one of the profile target population and some of the, the characteristics that we looked at and the descriptors that was emanating from the farming population. Um, in the Caribbean, you would find that many of this, uh, many of the islands in the Caribbean, there would not be too much disparity in, in um, the characteristics. They would vary in terms of relative percentages, but relatively you would have a reasonably, the challenges tend to be more or less similar across the region, maybe to some extent with the exception, with the exception of Haiti, where you, you tend to get um, um, more serious issues, but largely the other islands, you would get similar percentages along this line. So some of these characters will look at income generation, what is the, the, the why is the family into, into farming? And we had a very strong um, response as a motivator um, for being in farming or, or participating in agriculture. Um, um, in terms of participating in agriculture or requiring extension information, community benefits was, was not cited as, as one of the key motivating factors. Um, the, the need to minimize production risk was a very strong uh, motivating factor for wanting to ut utilize an application. Um, we have again farmers, the, the dependence on, on agriculture as a livelihood, very highly rated as a reason why they would require timely extension information and to utilize the app. The management horizon, whether the farmer would see himself utilizing that over a long period of time, most of them would say they would hope that applications of these types would, have, would be available to them over an extended period of time. And of course, access to extension advisory services, very highly rated. Participation in farmer-based groups. Minority of farmers are engaged in farmer-based groups, so they do not view that as a potential source of, 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 of information that they could use when necessary or, or, or any real services for extension that they would, that they would require. Um, in the daily activity. The access to phones in, the, in these islands, most farmers would have access to phones and of course to, to mobile applications. I think we also saw that in one of the earlier presentations, very high percentages for the Caribbean region. And of course, most farmers were willing um, to develop new skills in, in utilizing applications and they already had knowledge of, of social media applications. Um, the response to the app. The, the app in the pilot countries, and, and currently we are we are now looking at implementation in Jamaica, Guyana has requested. So we'll be going directly from country to country to activate the app. But in the three countries that we had piloted thus far, um, the app was very well received by both farmers extension staff and of course the the, the authorities um, in these in these countries. Most farmers were already familiar with, with social media like WhatsApp. So in the use of an app wasn't something um, um, too strange to them and being introduced to them. Um, introducing to them wasn't very uh, strange or didn't, it was not a tedious exercise. Um, in the Caribbean, what we have seen thus far, two areas that the farmers tend to focus a lot on the, the issue of crop agronomy and pest and disease management and market information, three areas, basically. Um, so these are the key areas where they, where they would constantly um, require um, information and real-time information um, at best. Um, the app, what it also permits is if it facilitates networking for farmer to farmer experience capitalization. So now we have a means by which farmers could actually exchange their experiences directly in a group. And the extension officers and other ministry, ministerial specialists can provide the technical oversight and guidance on what is being exchanged. Um, it definitely expands the reach of, of extension officers because rather than reaching farmers individually, 
one extension officer from a remote area could now, with one message, reach a multitude of, of farmers. Um, of course, greater quality control by the extension officer in messaging for, for the sector before um, with various extension officers going to different parts of the island. Um, there's no, or any island, it's not, there's no real guarantee that a message which is delivered by one specific specialist gets across as intended. With the application, it allows for everyone to see the message as intended or listen to a voice note as intended by the, by the, the, the authorities in the country. And the app as, as designed there could also serve as a monitoring um, tool so farmers could monitor the exchanges of farmers to see what is going on, where are uh, challenges, but also very importantly, as an early warning system for um, extension officers. And that in itself wasn't really on the radar during the development of the, of the app, but really it's an unintended uh, additional benefit that comes. If farmers begin to see farmer, uh, if extension officers begin to observe while monitoring the application, a number of texts in any given locale or could be not, um, nationwide that farmers are asking a specific question about a specific pest or specific disease or some specific affectation of his, of his farm, it could, it could alert the, the extension of it, say, hey, this is not a one-time occurrence. This is something happening to multiple farmers so that they could right away go in and try to identify and determine what the nature of the of the problem is, and see if they could address it or mitigate it before it could it could have um, um, a major impact on the sector. So in that sense, the app also works as some sort of early warning system, and of course, the, the app gives increased visibility and promotion of extension services who are able to regularly um, carry their messages and promotions and things directly to a large pool of farmers. What are some of the challenges? Okay, some of the challenges, you have differential access to internet services based on ge geographic area and connectivity. That's a challenge, not all areas in countries and particularly in rural communities are, are fully connected. And if you are going to use the app as a main, um, as a main tool for, for, for providing extension services to farmer, um, definitely the national forests will have to deal with the issue of connectivity in, the, in these rural communities where farmers are, are largely located. Literacy levels, you would know that we are, we are including written, written information and, and written instructions to farmers for the most part. So farmers who are not literate are at a disadvantage um, in, 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 in integrates of information that will be passed to them passed on to them. So that's an issue that, that has to be addressed. Probably part of it could be um, extension officers has to be creative in the meantime that that um, voice messages and other forms of, 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 of symbolic gestures can be included in addition to, to the information that is uploaded or ensure that other farmers who are literate could engage farmers who are not literate in immediate so I'm going to pass on relevant information. Um, insufficient ICT tools, equipment, and extension departments. Now, although we designed this app that, that could be utilized, and almost everyone has a phone nowadays, so it could be utilized readily on these smartphones that are available on the computers. We also have the challenge, and we have had some of the, the engagement with extension officers where that their personal phone is not what has to be used for that kind of, 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 of purpose, uh, if that becomes part and parcel of the working methodology of their various ministries, then ministries also have to find the resources to provide them with the tools. Maybe phones for that specific use of computers, tablets, whatever, for use in the app and engagement in the app. So that's a matter that has to be addressed and ministries of agriculture to make their fully functional has to provide some resources. Okay, administration of the app. Now, I mentioned the app is based on uploading of information as much as you want to farmers. You could have a whole universe of specific information for your country, but it has to be administered. Administer. Someone has to upload the information, mostly, most likely extension officers. Um, 
there must be some form of quality control for what goes into um, the, 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 the app for, for dissemination uh, to farmers. And of course, we have information changes. We have, for example, today you utilize some, some form of agrochemical, tomorrow that may, ban. that may be banned due to for whatever reason, health or, or, or safety reasons. And that information will need to be updated so farmers would know that you can no longer utilize that. Um, so there is that need for some kind of resource input by national authorities um, so that the app could remain functional, up to date, and relevant um, to the farmers and the system administration. Of course, ECA will continue to provide oversight of the use of the application to ministries and changes. And as we gather more information, if we, we need to update or upgrade, make upgrades to the system, we will be there. But also the ministry um, to make allocations for the registering of farmers, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and finally, um, there is also, as a result of COVID, one of the issues we also dealt with, I just wanna just present this one slide, that our ICT department also developed uh, another app. Um, it was initially developed for, for Central America, but we have modified it for the Caribbean region, and we are currently piloting it, piloting it in, if, in collaboration with CARICOM with eight member states of CARICOM. Um, the pilot is going on. In the next few months, we expect to launch it fully. And that particular um, digital application, um, one of the challenges we saw during COVID was that some countries, for example, like Jamaica, due to the, the severe um, decline in, in tourism, ended up with accidents in, 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 in poultry, because the tourist sector absorbed 25% of, of the poultry, but without tourists coming, you had that available. And you had countries which had um, deficits in, in, in certain food items, but there was no way of each country, everyone looking at their own particular interests to know what is available where. And we have developed this government to government Africa, Africa, agricultural trade portal where ministers of agriculture and of course ministries of agriculture could put on alerts if they have um, accidents in any given product or if there's a specific requirement in a country for a given product, you could put out an alert that goes to every member state. And if someone has the product or a company in the country has a product, um, you could automatically generate a contact and then put the two countries in contract or into contact with each other so that that trade um, request could be filled. Um, we hope that the, that the use of that app will generate greater interregional trade and, and much more interaction between the farmers because it, the information will be more readily available to them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Delis. Uh, it's very clear from your presentation that we do have systems in the region that work. Uh, the, the, the farmers had an issue, the agricultural extension officers had an issue they were able to transmit this information all the way to the policymakers um, and get the, get the situation resolved. So I think that's very, very positive and favorable. B before we move off of your presentation, however, there is a, um, a question that continues to be asked here. I know you mentioned it in your presentation, but what about the availability of the application for persons outside the pilot areas I know you spoke about it, but can you just repeat it for the participants, please? Yes, thank you. Um, for now, uh, the country, the app is country specific. So if you are in another territory outside the pilot, you have to wait till um, it has been activated for your country and then you will have access. And the reason why it is country specific for now is very simple. The, uh, the laws of countries differs. So there's no real harmonization of laws. For example, a pesticide that may be available in one country may not be available, may not be allowed in another country or, not, or may be illegal in another country. So you don't want that kind of cross interference of, of farmers seeing recommendations which are suitable for another country on the application and they go and apply it and they are in contravention of the laws. Some of the, the methodologies, applications 
of one country differs from country another country. They do not want to create that kind of confusion by cross-sharing information um, um, with countries. So when it is activated in your country, managed by the competent authorities in your country, then of course you could, could download it and, and they could add, they could admit you to that specific group within that country where you are governed by the laws of that specific country. Now, suffice to say, we, we are considering working on a regional um, um, version to that very same application, but we'll have to sit down, have discussions with CARICOM and the member state to see what elements, what components that we could jointly agree that should be included um, in that application. Thank you so much for that answer, Dr. Delis. As we bring this forum to a close, I really want to thank everyone here for staying with us. We certainly went over time, but it was very, we could not stop it. it the information was very relevant and that was shared with us. It is really good to know that we do have experts paying attention to the problems that we face and the experts have started working together to resolve these issues and we all do recognize that there will be challenges. We also recognize that the inevitable transformation must be done carefully to avoid any increase in digital divide due to factors such as education, access and scale. We, we recognize from the examples um, and best practices shown here, lessons learned, that we need to create a holistic and integrated environment and pay attention to the lack of infrastructure, the high costs of the technology, the low levels of e-literacy, digital skills, weak regulatory framework and other issues that need to be resolved. I'm sure we are all leaving here today knowing that Digitization, digitalization will change every part of the agri-food chain and will require us as individuals, as communities, as countries, as a region to, to develop the minimum conditions that are necessary. As we saw from the first presentation, from th there's a range from 32% to 90% of digital penetration and also to support the enabling ecosystem to develop that enabling ecosystem. Before we leave, I want to extend a final thank you to the stakeholders that supported this forum, ECA, FAO, ECLA, Relesa, MAPA, MAPA, and also our very esteemed presenters, Dr. Norma Samuel, Dr. Janelle Joseph, Dr. Victor Falguera, Professor Nia, Associate Professor Gwali Fang, Dr. Courtney Owens, Dr. Kurt Delis, I would like to thank um, Dr. Tessa Barry and the technical staff that managed to process today. Thank you all participants for your presence, your comments, your questions, your insights, which have all been noted. So with that, I bring the forum to a close. I thank you again and be safe everyone. Music